I've never given a lecture before. Um, so since I'm going to sit and talk about my own movies for a while in conversation, I, I thought I'd uh, start by talking a little bit about other people's movies. Um, Mike Nichols said about directors speculating on how other directors do their job is how all the rest of us uh, think about sex, which is, does everybody do it this way? <laughs> I'd also wanted to focus in particular on the beginnings of certain movies, uh, the opening sequences, the sort of, you know, the way we're first introduced to the characters, to the story, and how, you know, directors and, and writers choose to begin. Um, I think as many uh, filmmakers are in the audience as you, that you know that this is something we're tasked with inventing all of the time. Um, my friend Brian De Palma, who, who is also the subject of a documentary I made, uh, emphasizes that it's your only chance to introduce the audience to your characters and to your movie. This is your opportunity to do anything you want. And a director must take this responsibility very seriously. He said, think about how many movies start with generic aerial shots of the city. Why would you blow this opportunity? <laughs> with drones, this is even easier now to, to do. Um, but then you think about the opening of The Shining, where the aerial shots say everything. Those gliding images with that music, that strange, haunting feeling. So, of course, there are no rules. Or when we make them for ourselves, we need to know when to break them. Greta Gerwig pointed out to me that my movies tend to tell you what they're about at the very beginning. I wasn't aware of this. But it's embarrassing when <laughs> you go back and look. Uh, Mom and me versus you and dad is the opening line of the squid and the whale. <laughs> um, um, in Greenberg, Greta Gerwig herself says to the unseen car in the lane next to her while she's trying to merge, are you going to let me in? Interestingly, when I was doing press for Greenberg, an interviewer pointed out this line to me and that it told the whole story of the movie and of her and Ben Stiller's characters, that the movie was about letting people in. And I started to cry <laughs> because I had never thought about it this way. <laughs> Honestly, I just thought she was changing lanes. <laughs> So as filmmakers, we're aware of some things and not of others. And I'd like to keep it this way, if I may. I find in general that if you're successful in telling the story, the other things take care of themselves. I pick four movies and beginnings that I, that I love. I mean, they're movies that I love. Um, but they're also particular or special to me because of the ways that I came to them when I first saw them. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of clips, and um, the first is from Jules and Jim, directed by Francois Truffaut, uh, and the second is from Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese, uh, and uh, this is how both movies open. So um, I'm supposed to make this very obvious. So now we should play the clips. <laughs> On the <laughs> tu m'as dit je t'aime, je t'ai dit attends, j'allais dire prends-moi, tu m'as dit va-t'en.
C'était vers 1912. Jules l'étranger à Paris avait demandé à Jim qu'il connaissait à peine de le faire entrer au bal des Khazars. Jim lui avait procuré une carte et l'avait amené chez le costumier. C'est pendant que Jules fouillait doucement parmi les étoffes et se choisissait un simple costume d'esclave que naquit l'amitié de Jim pour Jules. Elle grandit pendant le bal où Jules fut tranquille avec des yeux comme des boules, pleins d'humour et de tendresse. Le lendemain, ils eurent leur première vraie conversation, puis ils se virent tous les jours. Chacun enseignait à l'autre jusque tard dans la nuit sa langue et sa littérature. Ils se montraient leurs poèmes et les traduisaient ensemble. Ils avaient aussi en commun une relative indifférence envers l'argent, et ils causaient sans hâte, aucun des deux n'ayant jamais trouvé un auditeur si attentif. Jules n'avait pas de femme dans sa vie parisienne et il en souhaitait une. Jim en avait plusieurs. Il lui fit rencontrer une jeune musicienne, le début sembla favorable, Jules fut un peu amoureux une semaine et elle aussi, puis ce fut un joli bout de femme désinvolte qui tenait le coup dans les cafés mieux que les poètes jusqu'à 6 heures du matin. Une autre fois ce fut une jolie veuve toute blonde, ils eurent des sorties à trois, elle déconcertait Jules qu'elle trouvait gentil mais ballot, et amena pour lui une amie placide mais Jules la trouva placide. Enfin malgré la vie de Jim, Jules prit contact avec des professionnels mais sans y trouver satisfaction. As far back as I could remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Um, there's a scene in um, a movie I made called While We're Young, where a um, uh, character played by Ben Stiller is giving a lecture. This. I had to imagine this because, I, as I told you, I've never given a lecture before. And uh, he has a PowerPoint presentation, and it stops working, and he tries to figure it out. And we tried to get some laughs that way. Um, I, I now know that experience um, <laughs> because the, I, in, in my dream of this moment, it would play through the entire montage at the beginning of Goodfellas. So, um, but there was some f breakdown in the communication, so you only got that first part. <laughs> that first part doesn't really relate to Jules and Jim as much as the part that comes after. <laughs> um, but it's probably on YouTube. Maybe someone could get it up on their phone and pass it around and could, uh, and maybe you guys remember it. Tony Bennett sings, I go from rags to riches, and he's, after he says, I want to be a gangster, we see him as a kid. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always great when people talk movies. Um, well, I, in, in, well, in 1990, I was uh, at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. It's about two hours outside of New York City, if you don't know Poughkeepsie. It's also uh, immortalized in the French Connection, where he says, do you pick your toes in Poughkeepsie? Um, Uh, I grew up with parents who loved movies, who sometimes wrote about movies, and who introduced me to many kinds of movies. But it wasn't until college that I began to truly appreciate international cinema. It was at Vassar that I saw Jules and Jim for the first time. And it's great when you see, I imagine people in the audience have had this feeling, hopefully many times, but it's great when you're younger and you see the right movie at the right time. Um, I felt elated when I saw that movie from the very beginning of that montage. And it seemed so contemporary to me. The ideas of friendship were very relatable to me, although the specifics were totally 
uh, out of my experience. Um, uh, and the, the, weirdly, the subtitle of prose, I thought it was <laughs> P-R-O-S. Um, and the, even the central love triangle, really the main story of the movie was, it was mysterious to me and it really remains that way to me to this day. But none of that matters because the movie has such feeling and such energy and I've returned to it many times over the years and it's meant different things to me every time I see it. And if pressed to say my favorite movie, which is always an annoying question, um, uh, just because I never feel like I'm gonna do, do it right uh, for myself, but I will often say Jules and Jim. I'll also say E.T. <laughs> the same week, I went to the Poughkeepsie Galleria, which was a mall 30 minutes from school where we'd go to see new movies, and I saw the new Martin Scorsese movie, Goodfellas, and it blew me out of my seat. And as a teenager in the 1980s, I was discovering a lot of great artists from the 70s and the 60s, and before that, often on VHS. Um, where I, I was told I should take a moment to explain what VHS is. Um, before it came out of the sky, you had to put tapes and things to play things. Um, you could record on them, you could record for six hours, but the quality was terrible. Um, my, uh, my, my parents got divorced, my father w was, seeing, a, 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 dating a woman who lived in Manhattan, which was very glamorous for all of us, um, and f for many reasons, but in Manhattan, they had cable. Again, for those of you, before it came out of the sky, <laughs> it came from under the earth. Uh, but in Brooklyn, we had no cable. They didn't give us cable. <laughs> now Brooklyn is everything. Everyone loves Brooklyn. But then, there was the, the, we, we weren't, worthy of cable. So she would record things on these six hour extended play tapes and they would just, she'd just run it on Showtime on it and then my father would bring them back and we'd be so excited and we would get things, I actually put this in the Meyerwood story as a version of this, but we would get things like Gorillas in the Mist, Scanners, you know, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop. It would just, it, it, so we would have these sort of triple shows that made no sense except it was just what they ran on, on the thing. That's a digression. Um, but often these filmmakers that I was discovering from the past, when I would see their new movies or things, you know, that, 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 that were coming out currently in the, in the movie theater, it, it sometimes wasn't considered their best. And I always felt like, oh, I was born too late. I, I, I'm not getting the best moment of this stuff. You know, I'm, you know my bond was Roger Moore. Um, uh, my Rolling Stones was the album Dirty Work which I, doesn't get much of a laugh because nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, um, but here in Poughkeepsie, I was seeing a classic in real time. My Scorsese was Goodfellas. And in Poughkeepsie, I felt like Truffaut and Scorsese were speaking to each other in some way. Because if you'd seen the rest of the clip, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this would make a lot more sense. But, um, so, because he tells the story similarly in the rest of the clip, um, uh, in, in that it's, but it's with Henry Hill's voiceover instead of this sort of omniscient narrator of Jules and Jim. And it has, uh, it tells you very deliberately what is going on. Um, and I would just like to add as a matter of fact checking that when I moderated Martin Scorsese's DGA screening a few weeks ago and I brought this up to him, his response was, Goodfellas is the opening sequence of Jules and Jim for two hours. I feel in both these sequences, the excitement of having the idea is expressed in the execution of it. And this is one of my favorite feelings in movies, and something I get often from both Truffaut and Scorsese. Uh, my friend Wes Anderson does this as well. There's an economy and an energy in both. We're introduced to the characters in a very direct way, as I pointed out, the, 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 the use of the voiceover is, is, is musical. Um, we're told Jules and Jim became friends. It's, there's no question about it. We're told I always wanted to be a gangster. It's, it's, it's not ambiguous. 
the sequences are almost complete in their way, like short films, but they suggest so much more to come. Uh, particularly in Scorsese's movie, the, the scene you did see with, in the car. <laughs> the accordion player is not supposed to come to <laughs> for another five minutes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the scene that we see in the car is mysterious, it's thrilling, it's violent, it's horrible. You know, and we also come back to that scene in a new context later, so it means something to us uh, differently later. Um, but there's also the thing of being in such, they're like announcing themselves as well, that you feel in such great hands. We all have that, that experience in movies where, I, I, I particularly don't like this in horror movies, uh, where I, if I don't feel like I'm in good hands, I. I and I have that feeling that anything could happen in this movie at any time, but in the worst way, because I feel taken advantage of, I feel manipulated, versus when you're with a director where you feel like anything could happen in this movie, and I love that feeling, because I, I will go anywhere with this person. I, watching these sequences feels physical to me. I mean, when I, when I look at them, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of participating in them. It's the way my father used to be when you sit on the couch watching Nick games. He would always kind of do this like wiggle with the, with the action of the thing. And I feel that way watching these sequences. It's so important too because what the, the, the movies uh, are about is how this visceral, giddy, propulsive feeling can't last, last forever. It's fleeting. Um, in Jules and Jim, it's innocence, youth, early friendship, early love. In Goodfellas, it's the rush of success, power. Um, I always think this movie is as much about success as it is about the mob. It's the party and then what comes afterwards. I'd also just to say also about the music uh, in Jules and Jim, George Delarue's score uh, is such an important part of it. Um, and uh, perhaps we'll talk about later for Marriage Story, um, you know, Randy Newman and I listened to a lot of George Delarue, and we looked at a lot of sequences, particularly in Truffaut movies, because of the way he uses it. In, in Francis Ha, I used many of these scores, actually used the scores uh, as a, a kind of collage to create a similar feeling of exhilaration. The music is big, it's beautiful, it's romantic, it's melancholy. Um, it doesn't underscore the scenes or push for feeling, it reacts. It almost springs out of the movie itself, and it plays the bigness of feeling. It gives a sense of both present and past tense, and the editing, the energy, I feel like is what feels so present in, uh, in, in these sequences, but the music makes it feel like past, and there's something very sad about that. I think, well, why don't we look at the, uh, there's two other uh, clips of openings that it also like to talk, uh, to introduce and talk about. One, the, the first one is from uh, Blue Velvet, uh, directed by David Lynch, and the second is from movie Trouble in Paradise, directed by Ernst Lubitsch. So let's play those two clips now, please. <laughs> She wore blue velvet, bluer than velvet was the night, softer than satin was the light from the stars. She wore blue Love was ours I love I held tightly Feeling the rapture grow Like flame burning brightly But when she left Gone was the glow Thank you. 
di venire qui a incontrare un signore. Mm, le tue solite storie. Yes, Baron. What shall we start with, Baron? Hmm? Oh, yes. That's not so easy. Beginnings are always difficult. Yes, Baron. If Casanova suddenly turned out to be Romeo, having supper with Juliet, who might become Cleopatra, how would you start? I would start with cocktails. Mm hmm. Very good. Excellent. It must be the most marvelous supper. We may not eat it, but it must be marvelous. Yes, Baron. Uh, in 1986, my friend Bo and I took the subway into Manhattan from Brooklyn and saw Blue Velvet at the Waverly Theater in Greenwich Village. I fabricated this episode in The Squid and the Whale. Uh, in that movie, uh, Jeff Daniels plays father, chaperones his son in a date to go see Blue Velvet, because I imagined it would be uncomfortable. Um, and David Lynch was very kind and lending me the, uh, the clip from Blue Velvet, if you've seen the movie, um, uh, Isabella Rossellini um, is naked and uh, bloody and says he put his disease in me. And then Laura Dern gives a kind of indescribable, it's almost, it's like an inhalation and an exhalation at the same time in reaction. And, uh, uh, I realized recently, actually, that 
that was my first um, collaboration with Laura Dern. Um, and I, all the time I'd been thinking that Marriage Story was the first time, but um, again, it came when an interviewer asked me about it. And I said, no, that was Laura Linney. And she said, no, but in the blue velvet. Anyway, so that made the, um, I didn't cry in this interview. Um, as, as I said before, this was a time when I was discovering great movies and, and, and a lot of directors from the past, but I was also lucky enough to be seeing these amazing new filmmakers of the moment in the theater. Uh, David Lynch, Jim Jarmusch, Spike Lee, the Coen brothers, Alex Cox, Jane Campion. It was a really exciting time for me to be discovering uh, uh, movies. And, um, you know, I, I think they, the, the sequences speak for themselves. They're very clear in certain ways. I mean, the Blue Velvet uh, clip, you start with something sort of familiar and something we've seen a version of before. Um, and then, but something is off and unfamiliar. Um, you know, and then, of course, we go even underneath uh, to this kind of horrifying, disgusting bug life. Um, and it puts you in a mood for what's to come. Although, what's to come in Blue Velvet is totally unpredictable. Um, but it also expresses how these things live side by side all of the time. Um, in college, I took a screwball comedy class which uh, was 30 comedies of the 30s and 40s, which had a huge impact on me. And I saw movies by Preston Sturges and Howard Hawks and Leo McCary and Frank Capra and Ernst Lubitsch, who directed Trouble in Paradise. And I'd never heard about Trouble in Paradise. I, I, didn't, even, I didn't know who the actors were. Uh, Herbert Marshall, who plays the Baron, Miriam Hopkins, who we see briefly uh, playing the uh, ukulele in the um, uh, gondola, Kay Francis, all wonderful actors, but not well known, at least uh, in 1980s. Um, uh, and my teacher, Jim Stearman, because you were, we were in a learning environment, they would point out these things to you, uh, pointed out the genius of starting with the trash gondola. And it immediately reminded me of Blue Velvet at the time, which I had seen already. Um, and, you know, setting you up right away for this idea that nothing is exactly what it seems. And beneath the, the surface, a, a kind of glossy surface, uh, there's a darker underbelly. And that these things are ever present and live together always. Um, but at the same time, both these movies are so inviting. Um, I mean, I, I, all four of these clips, you can't stop watching. I mean, if we could, we could just watch all of them. Um, and rather than talk, I'd actually rather watch the clips. Um, but um, Lubitsch is, I, I find, it really one of the best directors, um, I mean, ever. And uh, I drew upon a lot from Lubitsch uh, for Marriage Story. Um, his blocking, particularly his camera movement, which you saw some of there, um, the notion of performance. Um, often his characters are performing in some way, which you, you learn about that character. To be or not to be, another great one that he did is about a theater company in Nazi Germany. Um, there's also often a sense of facade, um, but mostly his incredible energy. So I, I mean, I picked these clips just as a way of introduction and a way to sort of talk about, even to get into talking about my movies because I, I feel like those are really exciting moments in life when you start to see connections or, or invisible conversations between works of art from different time periods. Um, and these four were particularly illuminating for me at the time um, when I was growing up. And I feel like, unfortunately, this happens less frequently as an adult. Um, but when I watch movies by these filmmakers, it brings me back to that sense of discovery. And as a creative person, that's the kind of headspace I want to be in as much as possible. I'm going to now show you the opening of my new movie, Marriage Story. And um, afterwards, we'll, we'll have a conversation and um, talk about that movie and perhaps some others. 
the clip should be shown now. What I love about Nicole, she makes people feel comfortable about even embarrassing things. Hey, you look like you care about animals. Yes, I do. She really listens when someone is talking. Sometimes she listens too much for too long. She's a good citizen. She always knows the right thing to do when it comes to difficult family shit. Colin. I get stuck in my ways, and she knows when to push me and when to leave me alone. She cuts all our hair. She's always inexplicably brewing a cup of tea that she doesn't drink. And it's not easy for her to put away a sock or close a cabinet or do a dish, but she tries for me. Nicole grew up in LA around actors and directors and movies and TV and is very close to her mother, Sandra, and Cassie, her sister. gives great presents. She is a mother who plays, really plays. She never steps off playing or says it's too much. And it must be too much some of the time. She's amazing at opening jars because of her strong arms, which I've always found very sexy. She keeps the fridge over full. No one is ever hungry in our house. She can drive a stick. How could you? After that movie, All Over the Girl, she could have stayed in LA and been a movie star, but she gave that up to do theater with me in New York. You might as well get what you paid for. She's brave. She's a great dancer, infectious. She makes me wish I could dance. She always says when she doesn't know something or hasn't read a book or seen a film or a play, or as I fake it or say something like I haven't seen it in a while. My crazy ideas are her favorite things to figure out how to execute. Let's try it. Crawling. Also standing. She's my favorite actress.